Our passage this morning comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 41. And we'll be reading verses 38 through 44, and then skipping to verses 56 and 57. And you can find this, if you're using a pew Bible, on pages 44 and 45. Hear God's word as we read. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this, in whom is the Spirit of God? And Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand, and clothed him in garments of fine linen, and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him ride in his second chariot, and they called out before him, Bow the knee! Thus he set him over the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no one shall lift up hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And verse 56. So when the famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt, to Joseph, to buy grain, because the famine was severe over all the earth. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you exalt the poor from the pit and you make them sit with the princes of your people. We thank you that you provide for your people. We pray that you would Feed us even now with the bread of, of your word. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> what do you really need in this life? What satisfies you? What is the source of all that is truly dear to you? The Gospel of John tells us an account where people were asking these questions. In John 6, we read of the crowds following Jesus, where Jesus did a miracle proving himself to be the Messiah. He fed 5,000 people. And realizing that they were going to try to make him king by force, he went away. But they followed him, and the next day they find him. And he says, you, didn't, you don't listen to me because you want me to be your king. You don't listen to me because you want the words that I have. You listen to me because you want a free handout. You want a free lunch. He says, that's not what I'm here for. I'm the bread of life. I came to bring salvation. And at this, the people listening say, well, why don't you do a sign, do a miracle to prove that these things are so? Jesus says, you need to eat my bread, my body, drink my blood. That way you can have salvation. And the people began to turn away. Jesus told them what they needed, what they should be seeking for in this life. But it wasn't what they wanted, and so they turned away. So there's two problems here. First of all, Jesus knew what kind of bread they needed and it wasn't what you get from a bakery. And second of all, Jesus hadn't suffered at this point. The people were looking for a Messiah like David, a mighty conquering king, not a Messiah like Joseph, one who was humbled, one who suffered, was accused before he was exalted. You see, the people didn't realize that both of these messianic types are fulfilled in Jesus the Christ and that Christ does give his people everything that they really need but it isn't always the bread that we want it isn't always what we seek for in this life 
This passage in Genesis about Joseph also speaks of a king who supplied God's people with bread. It prefigures Jesus' provision for his people, but also his suffering that led to his exaltation. Not only did Joseph keep alive the line of the Messiah during the famine, but he also provides a, a picture to understand Christ's necessary suffering and his consequent exaltation and rule. The basic message is this. There's a famine in this world. Do you trust your king to provide you what you need? Do you truly rely on him? Go to the king, the only source of grain in a famished world. Now, this text shows three aspects of Joseph's reign that are typological of Christ's. First, we see the basis for Joseph's rule, what was necessary that Joseph should become the second ruler of Egypt. Second of all, we see the nature of Joseph's authority <laughs> in Egypt. He had a mediatorial rule. He exercised complete authority over all the land of Egypt. And finally, we see the implications of this rule, of this authority, an exclusive call to all the nations to come to Joseph, the only source of bread. So what was the basis for Joseph's reign? We'll look at verse 38. It says that Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this in whom is the Spirit of God? And in verse 39, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. These are two unique qualifying factors that give Joseph what he needs to take the reins of the world's most powerful nation on earth at the time. God provided Joseph what he needed to fulfill the task that God had given him. We see two things. First of all, God provided Joseph the Spirit of God. This is the Spirit of God in Joseph, whereby he was able to remain faithful in his suffering and in spite of the difficulty. And it's the communion that Joseph had with God that allowed him to interpret Pharaoh's dream. Joseph was uniquely gifted to rule Egypt because he had the Spirit of God in him and he acted accordingly. The second basis for Joseph's rule in Egypt was his wisdom. And this is the wisdom that Joseph was granted by God that gave him the ability to save his, God's people from the famine, to know what to do when trouble came, to store up grain. Now, Joseph is a messianic type. And so it's not surprising that we see these two elements in Christ as well. Perhaps you might remember the words of the prophet Isaiah, who says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And what does Isaiah go on to say? And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. This was the kind of spirit and wisdom that Joseph had that uniquely allowed him to fulfill the role that God had given him. But it's also, it prefigures the spirit and wisdom that Jesus had to fulfill the role that God had given him. We read in Isaiah 42, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him and he will bring forth justice to the nations. God's servant, the Messiah, is prefigured in the person of Joseph. He's a man uniquely gifted with spirit and wisdom, set aside for a specific task. In Joseph's case, to provide grain for the nations, to all who would come to him. In the case of Jesus, our Messiah, he has the spirit of God and wisdom 
to provide salvation and justice for his people throughout the ends of the earth. Do you trust in your king, in Jesus, as the one who has wisdom, as the one who has the Spirit of God? Go to your king. He is the source of wisdom, the source of the Spirit of God. But having seen the wisdom and spirit that Joseph was given, let's look at the nature of Joseph's rule in Pharaoh's kingdom. Verses 40 through 44 speak of several aspects of this reign. We see his authority. Pharaoh says, You shall be over my house, and my people shall order themselves as you command. See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. This is pictured in verse 42. We see Joseph's signet ring, a sign of his responsibility that authorizes him to make official proclamations on behalf of Pharaoh. We see the splendor and the majesty of Joseph's estate, the royal garments, the finest Egyptian linen, the gold chain hung about his neck. And we see the subservient nature of all before him. As he rides in the char second chariot, his servants call out, bow the knee. And we see the pervasiveness of his authority. Pharaoh says, without your consent, no one shall lift up hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. But although Joseph has this power, it's a subordinate power. It's a mediatorial rule. Pharaoh says, only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. Joseph rules Egypt, but he does so in place of Pharaoh. He mediates between Pharaoh and all the people of Egypt, indeed between Pharaoh and all the nations of the earth who come to buy grain. And God put him in this place for a purpose. God put Joseph in this position to save the people of God, to save the messianic line from destruction and famine. Now, these aspects of Joseph's rule are seen even more fully in Christ. We read in the second psalm of the messianic rule, As for me, God says, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. Like Joseph's rule, Christ is subordinate economically to the Father. We read the Father's words to the Son in Psalm 110. The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Can you see these words applying to Joseph? Pharaoh says, Sit at my right hand and all before you shall bow the knee in obedience to you. This is a reign granted to Christ by the Father after his messianic suffering. It's a reign that reconciles all things to Christ. Do you trust your king as he rules over you? Do you trust him to provide you with what you need? You see, this reign has specific implications. Not only is it one of wisdom and the Spirit of God, a mediatorial reign, but it's a reign that calls all the nations to obedience to Christ. As we see in the text, Joseph is the ruler of the most powerful nation on earth, and the earth at this time is experiencing a famine. People are starving and dying, and Joseph is the only one with the life-giving grain. Joseph's mediatorial rule gives him great power in, in the world where he's the only one that is a source of food. Notice verse 57. All the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain. This demonstrates God's divine providence towards his people. It was through the suffering of Joseph that God raised Joseph up that he might preserve his people. 
so that God's promise to Abraham might be fulfilled and the line of Abraham might not be quenched in this great famine over all the earth. As was Joseph's reign, so is Christ's. It's through the suffering of Christ that God raised him up to save his people so that God's promise to Abraham about an offspring might be fulfilled, that the line of Abraham might not be quenched when the fires of judgment cover the earth. If you have put your trust in Christ, if he is your king, your mediator to the Father, then he will provide you what you need in this life and in, for the life to come. God, who didn't spare Joseph the suffering of prison so that he might save God's people, also did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How much will he not also graciously give us all things, all things that we need for life and godliness? Now notice the scope of this salvation. All the earth came to Joseph. This prefigures the promises of God that through the Christ, he would draw all nations to himself. As we read in the prophet Isaiah, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has shined. And as Isaiah says elsewhere of the, the Messiah, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. There's a famine in this world, just as there was in the days of Joseph. People are dying for lack of spiritual bread. Remember John 6? It's not physical bread that people need. It's the living bread, the bread of life. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Yet those who heard him turned away. Don't turn away from Christ who gives you the living bread. Trust him. Go to your king, the only source of bread in a famished world, and he will provide for you. Serve him, obey him, listen to his commands as he speaks through scripture. Depend on him in prayer to provide you with what you need, not with what you want. Trust him when you suffer remembering that your king also suffered that he might be exalted and cry out to him when you eat the bread of affliction. And above all, delight your soul in Jesus, the bread of life. Feast on his word and bring others from all the nations to feast at his table. There's a famine in this world and Jesus is the only one with bread. Go to your king, the only source of grain in a famished world. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you have provided for us the bread of life. We thank you for sending your son, for giving him a rule over us. Help us to trust him. Help us to be obedient. Help us to know that everything we need comes through him. Pray these things in Jesus' name.